Um, I think I was going to start with um, a question. I have two questions. So a 65-year-old man is undergoing intravascular therapy for uh, high-grade papillaries, so a TA tumor. According to a prospective trial, his risk of recurrence and progression increases if which of the following urine tests is positive after induction BCG? So he's a high-grade non-invasive tumor getting BCG. Which marker predicts his risk of progression? Okay. Five might be right, but, but there's a study that actually shows that uh, two is the correct answer. Uh, next question. So in 2016 AUA guidelines on non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, um, which of the following uh, recommendations are true regarding markers? So first one, urine cytology should be performed at regular intervals in every patient being monitored for non-muscle invasive disease. Number two, cystoscopy can be safely omitted in low-risk patients if one of the new genomic urine tests is negative. Number three, according to expert opinion, NMP22 can be a useful adjunct in patients with low-risk bladder cancer under surveillance. Number four, a biomarker may be used to educate equivocal cytology. So, yeah, and, and number five is the CX bladder detect can be used to screen high-risk patient populations for bladder cancer. Which one of those is, is in the guidelines? And uh, four is correct. So some people, a third of, of the audience has it correct. I think the, the important point is that uh, the other four factors are ex in, in the guidelines that explicitly says we should not be doing those. And I think... Uh, I'll come back to that, and, and uh, Sam will also be talking about the guidelines, I think. So my disclosures, I've highlighted a couple related to biomarkers. So when we're talking biomarkers, um, it all starts with cystoscopy. This, this remains our, our gold standard for detecting bladder cancer, whether it's primary detection or, or detecting a recurrence. Uh, but we know, of course, that, that patients don't like cystoscopy. We know that it's expensive, and we know that we miss things on cystoscopy. It's not the perfect test. So this has driven this, this ongoing search for the ideal bladder uh, cancer biomarker, ideal urine marker, to enhance the performance of cystoscopy and potentially even replace some use of cystoscopy. We can uh, imagine using a biomarker for initial diagnosis, so especially in the workup of patients with hematuria, uh, also for surveillance of patients uh, to, to rule out recurrence and progression after a prior non-muscle invasive bladder tumor. Of course, we would like to see tumors that we're missing on cystoscopy, so the invisible lesions, especially carcinoma in situ in the bladder, but also any upper tract lesion. It would be ideal if we could, if we could risk stratify based on markers, and of course, uh, it'd be nice to be able to screen for bladder cancer with a urine marker. Cytology remains the, the one old workhorse that I think all of us still use, or most of us probably use. And we like it because it can potentially pick up tumors that we're missing with cystoscopy, so the non-visible ones, especially the carcinoma in situ. And we like the very high uh, specificity of it, but we lament, of course, the poor sensitivity, and we're always dealing with indeterminate cytology reports, which can be quite challenging uh, to manage clinically. So what we really need is something that's easier, better, faster, and cheaper. So we want a test that is analytically easy to do and, and has uh, a robust uh, pipeline. We want it to improve the accuracy of our diagnosis. Of course, we want to reduce other tests, especially cystoscopy. It has to be cost effective. And we want the, re the report essentially while the patient's in the office or soon thereafter. So we have a whole laundry list of tests and these are, are just the selection of tests that have been um, approved or cleared by the FDA and they're all familiar to you but none of them really meet the criteria that we would like to have for a good test. And so why are we not using these tests more? It's always interesting to look. There's all these publications about so many tests. In the hematuria evaluation setting, the primary detection setting, one of the issues is that these tests are generally discovered in a case control population that has a very high prevalence of disease. So if you're evaluating a patient for hematuria, only 5 to 10% of those patients should have, in your office, would have a bladder tumor. Yet in the reports in the literature for the biomarkers, it's often 50% or so, which gives uh, a very optimistic report and test performance that doesn't play out in subsequent validation studies. And the biggest limitation is perhaps that we don't usually get very many validation studies beyond the initial discovery study. In the surveillance setting, it's, it's really the same issue. Here, patients uh, 
are more likely to have a tumor um, because they've had a prior history of tumor. So you're more likely to get an acceptable positive predictive value, but you're also more likely to miss something. The anticipatory positives are difficult to interpret, so a positive urine marker and a negative cystoscopy may actually be something that we just don't see yet. And most studies will not biopsy the bladder to make sure that the, uh, it's not the, the urine marker that is correct and the cysto that is wrong. But ultimately, the main hurdle, again, remains the lack of prospective validation uh, for the, uh, the biomarkers. So the AUA guidelines group has, has put together this very nice table that summarizes the overall performance of the usual markers. And you can see just without honing in on any of these numbers too much that they really don't, they're, they're not high enough. The sensitivity and specificity are not high enough to justify routine use in clinical practice. Which leads to the question, what is good enough to be used uh, routinely in clinical practice? And, and the group at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering asked this question a few years ago. They took 200 patients and use standard gamble method to ask patients how, how good does a test have to be to forego cystoscopy. 75% wanted the test to have better than 95% sensitivity. 21% would accept 90 to 95, and so there are almost no patients accepting less than 90%. 90%. Interestingly, men who found cysto particularly unpleasant were more likely to tolerate the lower accuracy. But you can see that patients want certainty, so they'd rather have the cystoscopy if it provides them with more certainty. And so if we go back to these clinical utilities, um, most of what we're talking about is really primary detection and surveillance. I do want to hone in, though, on the risk stratification question, because I think this is sort of a, a niche use of markers that uh, has some promising studies, and in particular this one from, from Ashish. Uh, these were intermediate and high-risk uh, bladder cancer patients, non muscle invasive bladder cancer patients getting BCG. And uh, Ashish and the group looked at baseline FISH, so this is a Eurovision test, and also again at six weeks, I think three months, six months, at alternative or additional time points as well. And it was very interesting to see that the um, FISH at six weeks predicted the risk of recurrence and progression. So you can see there are sort of four categories. If you started negative and stayed negative, you did very well. If you started negative and became positive, uh, you had a very high risk of recurrence and progression. Um, the same if you started positive and remained positive. So this gives us an idea of how we can use these markers in well based on well-designed trials to uh, guide progno prognostication, but potentially also um, treatment interventions. Nonetheless, for the bigger questions of primary detection and surveillance, uh, the, the experts in the field who, who write the guidelines are very clear that, that the tests are not ready for prime time. This is a, a document from um, the uh, National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry, and of course the, the AUA guidelines more recently have also laid out how we should use markers. And there are some good points here that are worth highlighting. So in a patient uh, who's had a prior tumor is under surveillance, of course, we do not use any of these markers to replace cysto. I don't think any of us are tempted to do that right now. I, I think this is an important point, too. In patients with low-risk disease, so they've only had one uh, low-grade papillary tumor, so TA tumor previously, we actually don't need to use any markers. So no, we don't need any cytology in these patients. I think a lot of urologists are probably using cytology. Uh, there's just no need for any markers in this patient population. And where we can think of using the markers are, uh, as I alluded to in, this, is in the trial that, that Ashish performed, and is looking at response to intravesical BCG, and then adjudicating an equivocal cytology. So if we have an indeterminate uh, cytology, it's atypical or suspicious for malignancy, but not, frankly, malignant, then a Eurovision fish or uh, an immunocyte can be helpful. So if there's so little value in urine markers, why am I even talking about them? Um, and I think it's, it's uh, although I'm a, a bit of a, a marker nihilist up to now, I'm actually very optimistic on, on where the field is going because there is a lot of, there are a lot of interesting developments and there seems to be a lot of uh, interest in doing proper trials. So we have a selection of new markers uh, on the market or close to the market and they're quite different from prior markers. So most of the prior markers are an individual marker, often a single protein. Um, and now we're getting into markers that are based on multiple uh, markers, and they're mostly DNA and RNA markers. So if you, if you look at Assure MDX, for example, it's looking at three specific methylation sites, 
and it's also looking at three specific mutations in combination. And then the CX bladder and the expert bladder cancer are both looking at five specific mRNAs in the urine, although they're both a different selection, the five do not overlap. And then bladder, bladder epicheck is based on 15 methylation markers. So the, these markers are quite different than the prior markers. And I'll just go through a couple as examples. So Assure MDX uh, was described first in this, is in this discovery study from uh, Rotterdam. And you can see the three methylation markers there and the mutations in very common, commonly mutated genes in, in non-muscle invasive disease, so FTFR3, uh, TERT, and HRAS. The trial is sort of your usual trial that, that has the main limitation that I highlighted previously, which it's 154 hematuria patients, of which approximately half have bladder cancer, so that's not what we see in the real world. Um, but exceptionally high sensitivity, 97%, and a very high negative predictive value, 99% when adjusted for what a normal prevalence, uh, prevalence in the population would be. So again, it's the discovery set, um, and we've been disappointed by many discovery studies before, but it's very promising. Now they subsequently went in and did a prospective validation at three centers in Europe. They had 200 patients, hematuria patients, again, approximately half of them with bladder cancer, and very similar sensitivity and especially the negative predictive value so these are patients where we really want to decide if they need a cystoscopy or not um, at, to, for evaluation of their hematuria. And so an ex exceptionally high negative predictive value would make us quite comfortable in potentially not doing that cystoscopy. Um, and in this trial, they calculated they could, they could re reduce potentially 81.7% uh, of their cystoscopies. There's an ongoing uh, prospective validation uh, in the U.S. and Canada, it's also at our site, um, that will be completed within a few months. Another marker uh, that is currently available in the U.S. is, is the CX bladder uh, marker. This is, as I alluded to, based on five different mRNAs in the urine. Uh, these markers do have potential biologic uh, importance. They're not just random letters uh, written up there. And CX Bladder has, has developed this as really three different tests. There's the triage, the detect, and the monitor, uh, depending on the, the scenario. And so the triage is trying to, to select out the very low-risk patients based on clinical parameters um, plus the test to decide if a patient even needs uh, a cystoscopy or not. Uh, and then the detect is, uh, is the higher-risk patient uh, with hematuria, and the monitor is the patient who's had tumors before. Um, and I'll skip over that. The, the CX bladder detect was published on almost 500 patients with gross hematuria compared to some of the established tests. And you can see, again, it's, it's a lot of numbers. Um, does this work? How do I, well, the mouse? I don't see it uh, doing anything. It wasn't responding to you. Wasn't responding, yeah, okay. The, uh, so you can see in the first column are, are the CX bladder uh, number. So an 82% sensitivity and 85% specificity, and it's only missed a few uh, TA tumors uh, in the middle there. Of course, the TA tumors are, are the most common. But it did outperform the established tests, uh, other than, of course, the specificity of cytology was, was very high. Um, in the, the CX bladder monitor has, has been looked at in a prospective uh, study of almost 800 patients. It was divided into a training and a validation cohort and again, shows very high uh, sensitivity and negative predictive value, um, although again, would need more, you'd say, would need more uh, validation to actually be used clinically. And they have, um, Yair Lotan uh, has published another uh, series of 800 patients, uh, and again, reports very high performance. So it's get, we're getting into a performance level that I think would be much more uh, acceptable in clinical practice. I think the, um, the path forward is also uh, just even, even more exciting. I mean, these are all very, very interesting and promising trials, uh, but technologies continue to advance, and there's a lot of work, for example, on next generation sequencing in cell-free DNA, and um, also uh, digital drop PCR, exquisitely sensitive uh, testing of specific uh, genomic changes in the urine that uh, you can also look at many more markers. There's, there's one group, for example, has a panel of, of over 90 markers looking at uh, mutations and other genomic alterations that should really capture almost every patient 
So I think the, the future is promising and uh, we likely will be using mar these markers in clinical practice uh, in the not so distant future. And that is it, thank you.